Had to be somewhere in the late 60s, early 70s, Brother Richard. I can't remember exactly somewhere along in there. My pastor, uh, who's with the Lord now, Brother Willie Bearden, uh, knew Miss Patty's mom and dad who were missionaries and had been friends for many, many years. And uh, my home church is Southern Baptist Church, but it's a country church. They just know that they're saved. They just know that they're Baptist. And uh, they have never been greatly involved in Southern Baptist politics and that sort of thing. Being out in the country has its, uh, has its rewards. You're separated from all, all the garbage that goes on. I, when I went to Griffin to pastor Southern Baptist Church, I had no clue about all the political wrangling that goes on in the Southern Baptist Convention and, and how difficult things were. And it didn't take me a few years to understand that. But... Uh, my pastor, uh, Brother Willie, brought uh, Richard and Patty in to our church and presented them as missionaries in their work, and we started supporting them. Uh, when Janet and I were very young, her hair was dark, mine was dark, and Richard had hair. <laughs> I've told you often, they were the very first independent Baptist missionaries that we personally got acquainted with. Missionaries in days past that I'd met, most of them were retired Southern Baptist missionaries, hadn't been on the field in a number of years, and that's not, that's not a slam against them, but to see somebody that was actually on the field. I think you, you folks were Nicaragua uh, during that time, or had done, because of the communists and everything, uh, that, all that was, uh, trouble was going on there. But we've maintained uh, a friendship through the years, uh, distant. They've been out of the country and then back here in the country now, and what a blessing to be able to have them here in church. I thank the Lord for their life and their faithfulness to the Lord for Brother Richard. Brother Richard, I want you to come and preach to us tonight and just kind of give our folks an update because I've been sharing with them this uh, prostate cancer thing and possible treatments and all that. And uh, sad that he said, Preacher, the, when we talked on the phone, he said, the, the bad thing about all this is I don't even feel sick at all. And that they're telling me all this stuff, you know, but uh, still, you got to get it taken care of. Brother, love you. Good to see you. Thank you, Pastor. It is good to be here tonight. And uh, always a blessing to come back to Elizabeth Terrace. And it uh, was in 1972 that we met. We came home on our first furlough from Nicaragua. I'd been a year in language school in Costa Rica. Patty already spoke Spanish, so she didn't have to go through language study. And uh, we came home on our first furlough in one of the first churches that we visited was uh, Subligna Baptist Church. And uh, your pastor, I think you were the song leader at that time, and uh, doing a great job, still singing great. <laughs> but that, uh, in just a month or so, that will have been 50 years ago that we went to Subligna. And Patty and I were talking before we came over, as far as Elizabeth Terrace, uh, in the early 80s, we came here, and so that's almost 40 years ago now that you folks have had a part in what we've done. And when you get to heaven, I can't spend all the time telling you all the places, the people, the churches, and things that have happened in those 40 years. But when you get to heaven, you're going to have a long time there to find out what your money and what your prayers did as you helped us there. What I'm doing now is going back and forth into Mexico, Costa Rica, and I'm about to get into Honduras and Nicaragua again. There were some political problems there last year that uh, kept me from going while I was in Costa Rica. But uh, when the pandemic started, we couldn't travel, we couldn't go anywhere. And we began to see churches having services online on Facebook and other places. So in March of 2020, towards the end of March, I started having a service Sunday afternoon not asking people to send offerings, not asking people to just to teach people that we had been in contact with, that knew us, were on our Facebook, or they could share information with other people. That's almost two years, well, no, two years now that I've been doing that. In January, I started, uh, I'm not following J. Vernon McGee, <laughs> wouldn't try to do that. But in January, I started having people read through the Bible, three chapters a day, 21 chapters a week. And out of those 21 chapters, I'm taking some of the most important things I think they need to know 
You can't do everything, but some of the most important things in those 21 chapters to teach the Word of God and show how the Bible fits together, how it leads to Jesus, how Jesus fulfills the Old Testament. So it's been a blessing. We've got some good comments. We have people in Canada that are Mexican that uh, from our church in Saltillo that moved up there. From down in uh, southern Mexico, San Cristobal, a family that was there in the 80s, uh, refugees from El Salvador, finally moved to Australia as refugees. He's a doctor, she a dentist. And uh, their children, of course, were little stair steps, three children, three beautiful little girls. They're married now, have children. But they listen to me over there in Australia. And uh, so it goes down through Mexico, Central America, into several countries there in uh, South America. From time to time, we have people. And I've gotten some strange requests from Africa and Asia and Europe. have no idea who the people are, but uh, every once in a while I'll get a request for a prayer and I kind of check them out. Some of them are a little, little suspicious. But you never know. The, the, the Word of God is going out all over the world. And uh, one of the blessings, uh, last year, year before, no, last year was the first time I'd gotten back into Mexico. One of the families down in uh, San Cristobal told me about the death of uh, the brother of uh, one of the ladies we led to the Lord many years ago. Her brother, she had witnessed to him, and finally, before he passed away, he had made a profession of faith and uh, was just thrilled. He knew he was going to die, but he wasn't afraid. And his family came down, and the Christian family began to witness to those that came from Mexico City and other parts for the funeral. And there was a young lady... She's uh, in her late 20s, early 30s. That was the daughter of that man. They witnessed to her, and she began to have interest in, in what they were saying, but she said, I just can't capture this. I, it's so new, because raised in Catholicism and all of the traditions, her dad had been involved in that until just in his last year and gotten saved, and everything was new to her. But she was interested, well... It turns out that Candy, the lady in San Cristobal, was sharing my Sunday afternoon message to her friends on Facebook, and this young lady was listening. And one afternoon she called, and it still thrills me, but she called to Candy and said, I understood. Amen. I understood, Amen. and I've asked Jesus to save me. Amen. And uh, I have no idea how many people's lives are being touched with, with what I'm doing. Patty speaks and uh, encourages the ladies, so it's the ministry. Last year, I was able to get back into Mexico. I had uh, tripped 1,200 miles from where I started out in northern Mexico down to almost Guatemala. Church is there, and uh, because of some car problems I was having, you're not supposed to worry. Does anybody here worry? About I was in a vehicle, and I couldn't find parts for it. I, knew I needed one relay for my lights and they kept going off and I knew if I got caught at night somewhere I was going to be in problems and uh, by the time I got down to uh, southern Mexico I'd already been in several churches ministries there but I had five other churches to go and uh, shingles started developing from the nervous situation I was under the pressure of that vehicle and uh, I started having some uh, pain here on my shoulder and one of the families, I had supper with them and mentioned that. They took me to their doctor, immediately got me on medication. And uh, I had five other churches I was going to, but they were all in hot climates. Where I was there, it was 7,000 feet up in the mountains. Very, very nice place to be in the summer. And the doctor said, you can't get back into the heat. It will cause you more harm. Stay here and uh, let this medicine start taking effect. So I stayed there five extra days and then drove the 2,500 miles to get back up here. And by that time, 90% of all of the shingles was gone. And most people were saying, they hurt so bad. And, and if you've had problems, you know probably what I'm talking about. But they said, how can he drive 2,500 miles with that pain? Well, I did. That's all I can say. I'm trying to get the shingle shot now through uh, VA, and I can't seem to get all the paperwork together, kind of like what you're talking about. 
But uh, I'll be leaving. I should be in Mexico now. January, I got the call from our doctor, family doctor, said your PSA was high on the uh, Medicare annual exam and you need to see a urologist. So he set me up a date. It took into February to get that started. And then the urologist said, okay, well, you're going to have to have an MRI. Two weeks to get that set up. And then after the MRI, okay, you're going to have to have a biopsy another couple of weeks. And you know how all that goes. But through it all, uh, finally the bone scan. And uh, there is cancer. It was a Gleason 8, 4 plus 4, if you know all of that stuff. You've, you've probably heard those things over the years. And they were worried about it because my age. I studied quite a bit on the Internet about it and found out that 97, 98, 99 percent cure rate and men that it's caught. And I was telling that to the radiation doctor that I went to before having the, uh, the last uh, bone scan. And he said, I hate to tell you this, but with your age and the number that you have, it might be 80 percent. It might be less. But that was before the bone scan. I had the bone scan. They were worried that it had spread. Had the bone scan, the radiation doctor called me the next day and said, we are thrilled because you have nothing showing anywhere else in your body. It's all contained right there. And we'll get started on that. And I have several, two more procedures in the next two weeks. And then the radiation will start. I'm looking at my calendar right after Easter Sunday for five weeks of Monday through Friday. And then the last, the sixth week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And then uh, that will be all the radiation. And I'll head to Mexico. I'm already got my car getting it all ready to go. But y'all keep praying. I, I have no idea. Do you know Sam Cravette? Yeah. Okay, he's about a month ahead of me on uh, the very same doctors, the very same treatment. So he's keeping me informed on what I've, what's, what's out ahead. Like you just helped me with that CPAC machine. He's helping me with what I've got in front. But uh, God is good. Yeah. I'm not worried about this. It's, uh, I'm 78. Patty and I have been involved in missions 53 years now. And when I was thinking back 40 years of coming to Elizabeth Terrace, I was remembering those services across the street there in that cramped building where I tell you the singing, it echoed, and it, was, it just filled you with joy to, to be in a place where people love the Lord. And I'm not saying you don't love the Lord here, but we're spread out. And the building was small and everybody was packed in. I'll never forget the services that we attended there. And just knowing that you folks have had a, had a heart for the work that we're doing, it's not because of our personality or persuasion. We just thank God that he inspires people, encourages people to give and pray for us. We're still involved in the work. When I spend time in Mexico, it's counseling, talking with younger people, it's preaching, teaching in homes of believers, helping them with problems, difficulties. One of the men uh, told me eight years ago when I was down for an anniversary of the church we started in Saltillo, he said uh, at the end of the Saturday, Sunday night service, after we'd had Friday, Saturday, and Sunday fellowship and food and preaching, they were giving testimonies, and this man stood and said, well, I just want to say I'm so glad that Brother Richard is able to keep coming back. We need old men like him to tell us and remind us that being a Christian isn't just for a few days, it's for the rest of your life. And I thought, well, I was younger then. But it's true, I'm an old man. I thank God Patty's dad, at my age, was already in heaven. And he had served the Lord over 50 years, he and his wife, raising the family down in Mexico, Central America. And God has given me a longer life than, uh, than her father and my ability to still be able to travel, to preach, to teach. I think I think right, and uh, you'll find out tonight, I guess. But uh, God has been good, and uh, what this is teaching me, uh, I can remember sitting there in Erlanger and the, uh, waiting for the... Uh, uh, biopsy they said to be there at 7 30 
Got there at 7.30. Waited downstairs. Finally took me. Got me prayer, prepared. Rolled me up to the last thing. It's kind of a half moon shaped area. Little places where people on their gurneys were there waiting to go to their surgical procedure. And I stayed there about two hours. And uh, people would come in and be there 10 or 15 or 20 minutes and then head out. And I finally called a nurse and they said, well, we've had a little backup. We'll take, you're going to, you'll get yours. But God showed me something. And I saw something I'd never seen before. The people coming in, having someone counsel, a doctor, an anesthesiologist, preparing them for things that were dealing with their life. And here I was. I'd never seen that before. God is blessed with good health. Never seen that. And it opened my eyes to people and needs that, uh, that others have. You know about the throat incident. Two years ago in May, May the 29th. Uh, the result of that, I can't sing like I used to. I never sing by myself hardly. Very rare occasion. But I just don't have the volume. And uh, the surgeon told me that would happen because of the muscles that were cut on that attack. The man that did that uh, received 25 years. No parole. The judge said, looking at the video they presented from the MAPCO station there, they said, in all of my years in the, in the legal system, I've never seen a more violent attack than what you did to that stranger. And we're not going to allow this county or this area people to think they can attack someone and get away with a slap on the hand. And uh, she gave him 20 years for the initial attack, five years for trying to stab me on the floor. And uh, I, I spoke to the judge, spoke to the man, told him I had no malice. I had no idea why he did that to me, but God allowed it. Job, God told Satan, you can do something to his body, but you can't take his life. And that was consolation to me that night after the attack and laying there after surgery. God had a purpose, and uh, one day we'll understand all of that. You've probably been through so many things. You know more about heartaches and difficulties God has blessed, even though we've traveled through Mexico, Central America, areas that you would consider dangerous and ungodly. God's protected us, allowed us to be there, and kept his hand upon us. And this, this was so strange. And one day we'll understand all about it. Open your Bible to John chapter 4, if you would. I don't know what time you normally get out. I'm going to look at my... Oh, my... You, I hope you get out around 9 normally. <laughs> I'm kidding. John chapter 4. I know you've heard messages out of this chapter all of your life. And if you're here tonight and you've never heard preaching out of John chapter 4, you're a very rare person. It is one of the most beautiful chapters in the whole Bible. I started preaching out of this chapter in 1972, Jesus the missionary, the way that Jesus had to be at a certain place. He was there. He gave the gospel. And because of him being there, many people were saved. And uh, there are just so many ways to look at John chapter 4. Last year, three churches in Costa Rica asked me to come down and speak in their missions conferences. And uh, it's always a blessing. You might say, well, why do those countries, they're, they're the mission field, why do they want to have mission conferences? Well, Patty's mom and dad took the gospel, started a church in San Jose, and they began to start churches out in other communities. And the gospel doesn't just get somewhere and stop. Yeah. It continues. That's why you folks support missionaries. Yeah. It goes out, and when people get saved in an area, then after they grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord, they realize, hey, we've got a responsibility. So these pastors said, would you please tell us what your theme is going to be so that we can do some publicity and get people kind of uh, encouraged about what you're going to be presenting. I prayed about that for a while, and God brought me back to John chapter 4, and there's three words in Spanish. Does anyone here speak Spanish? Okay, just Patty. The three words are dame de beber. And I had three messages out of those three words. I'm not going to preach all three of them here tonight. But three words, dame de beber. And that was the basis of the 
three-night uh, missions conference there in Costa Rica. But it, it was such an inspiration to me. In one of the churches, when they realized what they wanted, uh, it was going to be around Jacob's Well, they got some old tires, covered them with paper, made it built up about yay high, built the platform there with a bucket hanging down. They had Jacob's Well, and it's the most beautiful illustration of something. But uh, it, it was just such a blessing to preach about Dame de Weber. I want to share a few thoughts with you tonight that comes out of that. In English, it's give me to drink. And we're going to find those words three times. John chapter 4, I'm going to read the first 15 verses. You've been sitting a while. Would you all like to stand for a moment? Stand as we read the Word of God. If you don't want to stand, if you can't stand, I understand that. But you've been sitting, and uh, I just want you to stretch your legs for a minute. Let's read the first 15 verses. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, Though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Father, bless your word. Thank you for those that are here tonight. They chose to come, to pray, to sing, to honor and worship you. And I pray that you would give them something to go away rejoicing that they've learned from your word. Direct their lives, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Give me to drink. I want to just pick out three things here. First of all, when Jesus spoke to her the first time, he said, give me to drink. He was talking about physical water. And then the second time, in verse 10, when he said, if you knew the type of water I could give you, you would, and you would say, give me to drink, he was talking about spiritual water there. But then in verse 15, when she heard that you don't thirst again after you get that water, she was thinking of just convenient water, water that would keep her from having to come out to the well every time. You know, there, I, I was in a Baptist church. I was a member for years. That was convenient water. It wasn't that water that gives you springs up to everlasting life. It was convenient. We, I, I know a lot of people that grow up in church or they join a church because they want convenient water. They want to be associated with a the church. They want to do religious things. And it just feels good. And you stand good in the eyes of the community if you're in a church and you're doing religious things. That woman wanted something convenient. But Jesus said, no, that, that's not it. And he went on from the physical water to the moral and then the spiritual. And uh, thank God that woman believed. And she went running into town talking to people. But the three things in, that, in, in the three words that I want to emphasize, give. That was the first word he said to this woman. He didn't know her. Well, I can't say that because he's God. He knew she was going to be there. That's why he was there. But uh, humanly speaking, he knew nothing about that woman. She didn't know him. 
And yet he spoke to her. He said, give. You know, when you ask a stranger for something, and we have panhandlers, we have people all the time that come up and ask for things. But uh, we had scavenger hunts with our young people where we would send them out to bring back a list of things that we would give them just to have some amusement. And they would go up to strangers saying, do you have this? Would you give me this or that? And, but here, Jesus is speaking to a Samaritan woman. Uh, who, Jesus is the Son of God. He's holy. He's the creator of everything. And he's speaking to a Samaritan woman. Now, we know from her, her testimony that Jesus later brought out that she was a worldly woman. She was, she'd been married five times. Maybe her husband's died. We don't know, but she was living with a man that wasn't her husband. That didn't give a good testimony. So Jesus, the Son of God, is saying to a woman, Give, give, give. How did he speak to her? Did, did he just say, give me something to drink? Do you, do you think he spoke to her that way? Uh, Jesus, the Son of God, he knew about her life. He didn't disrespect her. He didn't look down. He spoke with respect to a woman that had a spiritual need. And for, we, you know, you, you see somebody living openly and you know about their life. It's easy sometimes to come down hard on people and to speak to them in a way that really dishonors them. Jesus didn't speak to that woman that he could have. He's holy. He is God. And she is living in sin. He could have jumped on her like a chicken on a June bug, like some preachers say. He could have done that, but he didn't. He said, give me to drink. Give. He spoke in a polite way. Let me ask you a question. When God speaks to you, how does He speak to you? How does He speak to you? I don't know that He's ever yelled at me. I deserve it, I'm sure. But I don't think God has ever yelled at me. He's never threatened to me. When God speaks to me, He speaks to me through His Word. He speaks to me through that still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. He speaks to me through preaching and through listening to uh, preaching. Pastor and his wife, how many messages? 25 or 15? Or... No, they just got a full plate of messages. Why did they go there? Because we as preachers love to hear preaching of the Word of God because we need to hear God speak to our hearts. We're not perfect. But Jesus spoke to her in a kind voice, in a way that respected her, even though he knew all about her. How does God speak to you? I'm assuming he speaks to you. Let me just say that. He spoke to me November the 23rd of 1966. I was a convenient Baptist for many years. I was even in Bible school, just met a fellow student from back in the 60s. When I came to Temple in January of 65, I was lost. But I was religious. I was a convenient Baptist. I was doing religious things. And I wanted to do more religious things. I'd been overseas in the Navy. I'd seen idolatry. I'd seen immorality like I never dreamed of. And from growing up in a Baptist church and joining a Baptist church, I'd, I'd learned a lot of things about Jesus, about God. But I didn't live all of that. It was just convenient. On November the 23rd, 1966, Sitting in a Bible class, God the Holy Spirit really spoke to me then. He didn't yell, that still small voice. He just said, Richard, I've spoken to you a lot of times. I've called you to repentance. And very, very, I, I'd had my hands gripped to the pole. You've heard people say that. I literally, I would raise my hand that I was lost, but I would not go forward. And there that morning, the Holy Spirit said, Richard, Spoken to you a lot of times. If you don't want me to speak to you anymore, I just won't bother you. And that shook me to the core. Because I knew I needed to be saved. I left that meeting, that class, and went and talked to a pastor and said, I need to be saved. He read me some verses, said, I can't save you. God can. 
but you've got to do business with him. God spoke to me, directed me. Through all of these years, I, I wish I had time to tell you of all of the ways God has led Patty and I. He speaks. He directs. When Jesus spoke to that woman, he spoke in a respectful voice. And I, I, I know that he speaks to you in a way that you can hear and recognize his voice and know that God, the creator of this world, the Savior of this world, the Son of God, the Holy Spirit of God is speaking to you. And He wants to speak to you. He wants to guide you. Uh, sometimes He asks you for time. He asks you for time to read the Bible, to pray. I mentioned reading through the Bible, trying to get people to do that. That's been one of the things I've encouraged people all my ministry. Because people need to know Everything that God has written. I tell you, my mom, 97, when she passed away, she had read through the Bible. I have no, no idea how many times. One of the last times that I was taking care of her in her last year, she was in the Old Testament and she said, Richard, there's a lot of killing going on back here in this Old Testament. And you know, I, I wonder sometimes if people don't want new believers to read the Old Testament because of some of the things you see there that might be hard to comprehend not knowing the whole picture. That's why I've chose 21 chapters and the most important things to bring out. But people need to read the Bible because God will speak to us from the Bible. He'll ask you for time for prayer, for church. He'll ask you for service. And it's your reasonable service because of what God has done for us. The possessions, time, service, possessions, God asked us for things. It's been a privilege for Patty and I. These last two years, we haven't traveled as much. We thank God for the churches that support us as you do. But we've been able to share since we weren't spending money on travel like we've done for so many years living in foreign countries. We've been able to send Western Union money to pastors and people down in Central America and Mexico that have needs. And it's been a blessing to share because it doesn't just end with us. We don't just get it so that it stays with us. We give just as you give. And God asks us to do that. The second word, give me. Give me. Again, this is a Jew talking to a Samaritan. You know, but there's, there's a lot of anger, as one of the missionaries mentioned, problems in foreign countries against Americans. Uh, sometimes when a stranger talks to a person of another nationality, uh, there's some suspicions, there's some ill feelings. And this woman immediately said, why are you talking to me? I'm a Samaritan. You're a Jew. We don't have any dealings between us. Why are you talking to me? She was saying, why me? And sometimes when God asks us to do things, that, that question comes up, the Lord, why are you asking me to do that? Give me. You're a Jew. Why should I give that to you? You work for your income. You have expenses. You have family. You have needs. Why should you give to people in a foreign country of a different nationality, a different race, different color, different language? Why would you give? Give me, Jesus said to her. And uh, she just had questions. Ananias, one of my favorite characters in Acts chapter 9, when Saul met Jesus there on the Damascus road, he fell blind, he couldn't see. Three days he was in Damascus praying, and God told Ananias, one of his, uh, one of his servants, he said, Ananias, go over there and put your hands on Saul's head and pray for him. And those words that Ananias said are, are just so human. He said, Lord... I've heard about that man. I know why he's coming to Damascus. He's persecuting people like me. And you want me to go over there? And Jesus just said, go. He's a chosen servant. Just trust me. And this woman, she had questions. You know, why are you asking me? Why are you even talking to me? Why should I give you anything? Well, you've heard his voice. And you know that when he speaks, 
There's something that God wants from your life, just as Jesus had a need from that woman. Give me, and then the last words, to drink. He got to what he wanted. Give me to drink. Would you believe, let me, let me say this first. Do you think Jesus was sitting there by that well, thirsty, without any ability to get water out of that well? Just think about it in a moment. He raised the dead. He calmed the sea. He healed the, the sick of all types, the blind, the leprosy, all of those things. Jesus, the creator, as Jesus sat on that well, he could have put his hand out over the water, that opening, and said, water, I'm thirsty. Would you come on up here so I can just reach my hand and get some water? I'm thirsty. God, Jesus could have done that. He's God. He's the creator. He has all power. Did he really want water from that woman? Because if you'll notice, she never gave him water. She never gave him water. She left the water pot and ran back into the city. Amen. Jesus wanted to talk to her. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I mentioned earlier, Jesus being the son of God had to be there at that well when that woman came out. She was the key to opening that city of Sychar with knowledge of the son of God. He said, I'm the Messiah, and she believed. She went back, others came out, and they believed in Jesus. She was the key. But he wanted to talk to her more than he wanted water. A lot of times when Jesus asks you for something, he's got other plans for your life more than just what he's asking you to give. The time that he asks you to spend reading. He's got something he's going to teach you that's going to change your life. Praying, he's going to answer prayers. And you're going to be encouraged in the work of God. So many ways God does things indirectly. He asked for water. But the thing he wanted was to talk with her. And expose himself to her as the Son of God, as the Messiah. You know, she said, we know that one day the Messiah is coming. There were Samaritans. And there's a long history going in the Old Testament about Samaritans. I won't go into that. But she knew the word Messiah. She was the one in that whole city that could open them up and explain to them, he's the Messiah that we've heard about. She believed that the Messiah was coming and Jesus presented himself to her. He wanted to talk to her. As I was looking uh, on the, the internet today, I came across something I'd never seen before. Someone put exactly what I just said that when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, he really didn't want water. He wanted to talk to her to change her life. And they were saying, that's why we need to talk to people to change their life. Uh, God speaks to us and God directs us. He wants you to talk to people. You don't talk down to them. You don't talk to belittle them. You don't talk to them from that self-righteous position that you're so much better than them. They have a need. They have a spiritual need. Jesus spoke to her. How do you talk to people? Just think for a minute. How do you witness when you go out witnessing? When you go out, when you give out a tract? How do you speak to people? How do they take that and take your attitude as you give it to them? I hope that they can see Christ in you, that you, they can sense your love for them. Jesus was misunderstood by his disciples by talking to that woman. They came back and they were astonished when they saw him talking to a Samaritan woman. A Jewish man by himself talking to a Samaritan woman by herself, that just didn't happen. They, they were astonished. They, they misunderstood. And they said, why is he talking with her? And then they said, Master, we have food to eat. It's time to eat. He said, I've got food to eat that you don't understand yet. And they said, well, did someone give him food? Folks, if you talk to people, somebody's going to misunderstand you. They're going to call you a holy Joe like they used to. Now no telling what the word is that he would use here. We hear it all the time. You're a little, little uh, Jesusito. You're a little Christ. You're a little Jesus. Uh, you're a little do-gooder. 
People are going to misunderstand why you're talking to people. But don't let that hinder you. Jesus said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. But you know, after the Holy Spirit came the day of Pentecost, they began to talk to people like they'd never talked before. They understood that satisfaction. There is a satisfaction that comes from talking to someone, witnessing to someone that far surpasses the food that we eat that gives our body satisfaction. There's a spiritual satisfaction that someone has been born again because you talked to them. You shared the gospel with them. It could be in your family. It could be the people you work with. Neighbors. Unknown folks that you just meet somewhere and give a track, give a word of witness to. But folks, there's satisfaction in serving Jesus. I'm not going to go into all the details, but she went into the city, told people what had happened to her, who had she met, and they came out. They came out to meet Jesus. And that happens on the mission field. Someone gets saved. Their life is changed. They leave idolatry. I think of a, a pastor's wife. Her husband died two years ago in July. They were saved in 1983 down in San Cristobal in southern Mexico. But that man got saved first on a Tuesday night. His wife got saved on Thursday night after she saw the change in his life. She went home. She said, we got all of the idols, the different things we had hanging on our walls. She said, I took them out and threw them in a river because they hadn't done any good for us. Why would I want to give them to anyone else? That man became a great preacher of the gospel in the dialects that I could only dream of ever learning that they speak down in southern Mexico. Churches everywhere out in the mountains where they sent him as a school teacher that he opened because he got saved and his wife got saved and they began to serve the Lord. I still stay in touch with her and I see their kids. I preached in their church Last year, when I was there in uh, June, before I got sick with that hepat uh, not hepatitis, the, the shingles. And what a blessing to see about 150 or more people there. I, my message was translated to their dialect so they could understand what I was saying in Spanish. It's still growing. Folks, talk to people. Even though you might be misunderstood, someone might criticize you, talk to people. Because the gospel is a communication. Jesus was there. He, he wanted, maybe he was thirsty. We can imagine. They didn't have cars to ride in. No air conditioning. They didn't have bottled water. I was offered a bottle of water before I came up here. Water's everywhere. It's convenient. But it wasn't then. But Jesus could have had the water raised up to his level. He wanted to talk to her. Folks, when God speaks to you and says, give something, time, service, possessions, when he says, to me, give it to me. You're going to serve other people, but give, give that time. Give that Bible, give it to me. Let me teach you. Then you'll be able to give. And you'll give the water of life. And people are going to be saved. There's a woman in the Old Testament named Rahab. You all are familiar with her. I just went through that on my Spanish meet on Sunday afternoons. And what a blessing it was. I learned some things there I'd never seen before about Rahab. Every time her name is mentioned, it's Rahab the harlot. Rahab the harlot. It's in James in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, in the New Testament. It's in the book of uh, Joshua there, when they were going over to conquer the city of Jericho. Those two spies went into the house of Rahab the harlot, and you say, well, why? They didn't stay at the Hilton. They would have attracted attention if they'd gone somewhere like that. We, we don't know. But the truth, Rahab was like that Samaritan woman. She had heard what God did with the Red Sea. She had heard what God did with Og and the other Shihon, the king over the other side of Jordan. And she said, our hearts have fainted within us. We know that your God is the true God. Yeah. That's why those men went to that house. Yeah. 
just as Jesus had to be there at that well. But you know, her name is in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1. But it doesn't say Rahab the harlot. She was a wife of a man named Solomon. And in Joshua chapter 6, after the walls fell, it says that she became part of Israel. You know, I'm glad that people don't run around saying, Richard Comer, man, if you knew all the things he did in the past, that doesn't stay with you. This woman was a Samaritan woman. I guarantee you her life changed. And I guarantee you that if she stayed with that man, there were some wedding bells ringing. Her life changed. Rahab, the harlot, but she became part of the family of God Amen. and part of the lineage of the physical body of Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter what you've done in the past. Doesn't matter what your history is in the past. God wants you to be that blessing to others. Amen. Rahab saved her family. Amen. You've got to read that if you... That woman and Sychar saved because of her testimony. Many, many people saved. And if you will talk to people and let God lead you, many, many people will be saved. I'm looking at some folks that have been around here a while. You've been around the block a time or two, like the saying. More than likely, when I say that there's a satisfaction in leading people to the Lord, you're saying, yeah, I remember that. I remember that young man, that young lady, my niece, my nephew, my child, grandchild. I remember when they got saved. I've seen the change in their life. You're rejoicing in that. But if you've never led anyone to the Lord, begin speaking to people. And let that meat that satisfies more than physical meat, let that water that's better than physical water, let it just bubble up and be part of your life. Would you bow for me? Let's have a word of prayer. Brother George, would you come and lead us? Father in heaven, speak to our hearts as you've, we've presented your word. Do what you want to do here in Elizabeth Terrace. Be glorified in those that sit before me. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you if you would to stand with me quietly. Miss Janet's here at the piano. She's going to be playing an imitation verse uh, in just a moment. But I'm going to ask you to do this tonight. If you're here and you've got spiritual need, you need somebody to help you pray about something. You slip out and come. Let me know. Get somebody by the hand. Ask them to come. Uh, more important than anything else is that you let the Lord meet the spiritual need in your heart and life tonight. But then if you're here and saved tonight, I'm going to ask you, would you pray right now? And would you ask the Lord to help you, you, to speak to someone between now and the Lord's day about Jesus. Would you ask the Lord to help you do that somewhere in your family, among your friends? Right now, would you just pray as Miss Janet is playing? Again, if you've got a need, you come. But would you ask God right now while she's playing to help you to speak to someone about Christ between now and the Lord's day?